performing one more rep, even if your life depended on it. People get a little bit too scientific. They overcomplicate things. They're like, oh, the, you know, your legs need to be at this angle when you're doing a squat or your calves need to be. And it's like, just push, man. Just push, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, it's, it, it all comes down to how bad you really want it. And if you are as desperate for that last repetition as you are to breathe, then you'll get it. You've trained Hrithik Roshan, you've trained John Abraham. I'm sure you've trained many more Bollywood stars. Yeah. Is there a mathematical formula you follow? As an example, we'll talk about Riddick now. Is that I recently had him on like 4,800 calories. What? Uh, yeah, 4,800 calories because when I first saw him now, I was like, okay, you need to get in shape, but you have no muscle on your frame. He hasn't been training. Uh, so I really need, even though I wanted to diet him down immediately because he's holding so much body fat, we had no choice but to uh, you know, go into a mass building phase. So he was eating a lot of clean calories. There's some podcasts that we create with some personalities where I know that we've packed diamonds into the content. This is one of those episodes if you're inclined towards the world of fitness, hypertrophy, bodybuilding, powerlifting, general wellness, mental health, and holistic health in general. Chris Gethin is one of the world's biggest fitness icons. And after this one conversation, I personally got to know why. The entire world of fitness knows about this man's knowledge. But when you get into a deep conversation with him, you'll notice the ease with which he's cleared out concepts in his head by experimenting with his own body. We spoke about everything from peer-reviewed scientific studies to biohacking his own body. There's a lot of content that I wish for you guys to slip into. What I will say is that for more informative conversations like this, follow us on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This is one of the thickest episodes of TRS, packed full of science. And for old time's sake, all I want to say is let science the shit out of it. Chris Gethin, welcome to India and welcome to the Ranveer Show. Welcome back to India, rather. Yeah, it's been a few years, but thank you very much for having me on the show. Been yeah. looking forward to this. Yeah, I've been looking forward to talking to you for a very, very, very long time, probably since college. Um, I mean, when I began uh, lifting weights, it was all about Chris Gethin, which was back in 2010, 2011. So you've been in the Indian scene for a while. Uh, How is it feeling being back here? Feels phenomenal. Yeah, like when I first came here, I was surprised how many people knew me from my video series on bodybuilding.com because as we were speaking before the show, that, you know, bodybuilding.com was an office in little old Boise mm. and we only saw what was happening there in Boise. But to come then to other countries such as India and be recognized, it was absolutely phenomenal. But it's great to be back. I love the culture here. <laughs> you know, I think culture is lost in a lot of countries, especially with social media. People don't interact as much but I see people are a little bit more family orientated here in this country. And I like that connection. Mm. What else do you like about this country from a fitness perspective? Bodybuilding.com is huge here, by the way. Yeah. Like it's massive. It's something that every gymming bro has used at some point in his journey to just learn. Yeah. The one thing that I've noticed that I really enjoy this time around, and I don't know if it was because of the lockdowns over the past couple of years, but I, I go to bed super early. I may look like a party animal, but I'm in bed at 7.30. But I'm down at the beach doing my cardio very early in the morning. And I remember when I was here some years ago, I would be one of the only people down there. Now I see so many people at 6 a.m. doing their cardio, walking. And, you know, it's, it's just an absolute pleasure to see that many more people are outside being active. I don't know if it's because it was taken away from them mm. and now they appreciate it that much more. But I certainly do. And I... I I kind of vibe of the electricity of seeing so many people out there being active, no matter what age, you know, and, and I really like that vibe. Mm, yeah, I, I remember back when I'd started uh, training in life, there wasn't that much of a fitness culture. And we had to actually explain things to our parents. We had to convince our parents to allow us to take protein shakes. We had to explain to people that weight training doesn't harm your joints, things like that. Things are completely different now, where I feel that 
the kids who are taking up training now are probably what like 2000s born 2005 ish born their parents were born in the 70s their parents grew up training and lifting weights themselves so there's this whole new generation that's begun lifting weights especially in india and it's super mainstream this wasn't the case earlier yeah and i i think what really happened as well is that you know obviously you know Riddick looked great in yeah. in uh krish and then you had so many other actors looking phenomenal and people wanted to attain some sort of physique to maybe improve their own confidence more energy feel better about themselves and i think it became a little bit more accepted then as well because you know what you know what a lot of people in the entertainment industry are seen as you know they really really are loyal to them yeah. and i think that's been a really really good thing you know it's kind of what similar to what happened in the US like in the 80s and 90s when you had the Van Dams and the Stallones and the Dolph Lundgrens and everybody kind of followed that culture yeah. and the gym boom and then a the supplement boom and the same sort of thing happened here yeah yeah um you know i think what Schwarzenegger and Stallone did there it was uh, Rithik and John Abraham yo mm, early yeah. 2000s like they set the tone for how uh the ideal men should look yeah. you know uh, and and it inspired like one or two generations after that but i want to actually ask you about rithik a bit how did this happen because that's how a lot of indians have gotten to know you initially as the person who kind of transformed rithik i remember there was this one photo of him on the front page of bombay times where he spoke about a transformation and that's why he really spoke about you i can't remember when this was exactly but it was roughly like 2000 2011 11 right yeah Yeah so uh when did you start training Rithik? It was uh, probably around that time at the end of 2011 because I came earlier in 2011 to launch a book that I'd published and Simon and Schuster the publishers wanted me to do one of those launches here in India and once I did that our mutual friend Jag Chima gave a copy of that book to Rithik. Mm. He read the book and he was in a bad way at the time you know he'd, he'd just come out of a major injury with his back his doctors had told him to be bed bound for mm -hmm. a couple of months and he had been and uh, then he asked if I would be interested in transforming him because he was about to cancel the or postpone the shooting of Krish because mm. he wasn't able to uh, get in shape for it mm. but when I gave him a consultation I could see that the guy was definitely serious very intuitive and uh, so decided to kind of transform him and you know we'd s set up 12 weeks but uh we managed to transform in about nine and a half mm. weeks because his body responded so well mm. I'm, i'm assuming that his body responded well because he's had years of training behind him yeah it's that and uh he, he's got years of training behind him but he his body responds really really well and he's got such a small frame like a the smallest frame i've ever trained you mean like a skeleton yeah skeleton for okay. sure you know very small wrists very small ankles very small knees joints uh so a little bit of muscle on him looks a massive amount of muscle mm. you know so when we got in shape for uh krish you know he looked his absolute biggest yeah. but he was only like 68 kilos very wow, very really? and yeah the guy's six foot So mm. there wasn't much to him but when we were able to pump up specifically for different scenes carb load reduce the fluid you know he he looked very three dimensional because of the fullness of his muscle bellies which is genetic as well uh, along with uh, very small joints mm. okay correct me if i'm wrong here and i'm i'm literally carrying the chatter that goes on in indian gyms and carrying it to chris gethin himself um So what they say is that with uh, actors who need to get into shape uh you would assume that these guys are huge guys these guys are the biggest guys in the gym but the situation in reality is that the camera uh adds a few pounds firstly and secondly if you see those same guys in real life they probably like if they have a t-shirt on they'll probably even look skinny but the moment the t-shirt is off they look huge and the camera just picks up that hugeness as even huger hugeness is that true well yeah there's a few things to it of course you know they're going to get the lighting just right mm. now if i'm there on set but riddick's got a great eye actually so the the lighting that you would usually have in a scene is very different to allow the physique to pop you want more harsh lighting mm. so a lot of people want soft lighting to make right. you look smoother younger you got to go the opposite when you're trying to enhance the physique mm. so that's going to be one aspect of it and for every scene for instance with krish he only looked like that for a few hours 
And then the next scene where he has to be topless, we would leave that another week because then I'd have to carb deplete in him all over again and then carb load and then pump up and get rid of the fluid from underneath the skin. So it's quite a process to look like that for a few hours. He's not going to look like that all year round. Gotcha. Why don't we talk about this uh, that you spoke about, the, the uh, what did you say, carb? Carb, carb loading, carb loading and, de and depletion. And depleting? Uh, and by depletion, you mean the fluid in the body? Well, we carb deplete, so we don't eat any carbohydrates for several days. Well, maybe as, as long as a week. Okay. So no oats, no rice, no potato. It's just protein and fibrous carbs. So that would be vegetables, basically, like broccoli, lettuce, cucumber. <laughs> so, you know, you do that for a few days to completely get rid of all the pump or the glycogen in the muscle. Okay, and then once you're completely depleted, then we fill it up really, really hard. We load hard and then eat a lot of carbohydrates. Like he was on about 800 grams of carbohydrates and that's a lot. I'd get bodybuilders on that, but his body just takes a lot of carbohydrates. So when he then did some pump up, some exercises, the muscles just filled and filled and filled. And with that carbohydrates, it pulls the fluid from underneath the skin that makes him look even leaner and more ripped. So when does this process of the 800 grams of carb loading happen? Like right before the shoot? I like to do it three days before. So I will load the hardest three days before. Then I'll look at the physique the next day to see how many carbs we could probably push into him the next day and the day following. A lot of people do it the other way around. They'll carb load the day before, but then you could possibly spill over mm -hmm. where you look softer the day before if that body doesn't take in the carbohydrates that you think it would. Like he takes in more carbs than me mm. when it comes to carb loading. So everyone's different. Wow. How did you figure this system in life? Like as in, did you uh, customize it for him? Or is it like a standard system you follow as a coach? I followed that as, as myself when I competed in uh, drug-free bodybuilding for 10 years. 10 years. And I, I got as high as second in the natural world championships. And I was competing every year. So I was using myself as a guinea pig because I didn't have any coaches. I didn't really, I wanted to learn myself mm -hmm. how the body would react. No one's going to know me myself better than I would, you know? So a lot of it was through trial and error and then having other clients and trying different protocols on them. Mm. Um, I mean, I'd love to know that when you're taking on a Bollywood project, you have trained other stars other than yeah. Hrithik as well. Um, what is the brief given to you? Uh, in terms of, I'm assuming that the director or the art director, someone will tell you that, listen, we want the body to look like this, Chris. So how do we go about it? Uh, there's a lot of Indian coaches watching this where, um, you know, their clients tell them that, okay, I want a body like Hrithik in this movie or like John in that movie. So this is sort of a 101 for them as well. And if you can boil it down to the basics, that would sure. be even better because there's teenagers watching this as sure. well. Sure. It's basically, I, I like to learn what the scene is. If the scene is like action and it, that person has to do something powerful, explosive, maybe it's fighting someone, mm. then I want their physique to look bigger, stronger, more imposing and fuller, bigger. So then I know what sort of carb loading process, depletion process, how much to pump up the physique. But let's say if it's a, a dance or a mm. romantic um video or something like that, then I know the physique needs to look a little bit more slender, a little bit more symmetrical and balanced, less imposing. So then we don't push it as hard. Mm, okay. So you keep an end target of how you want the scene to look like in your mind. Yes. And then everything from the diet to the workout program is altered based on that. Exactly. It's mostly nutrition based. Okay. And mostly, yeah, from a pump up beforehand base, gotcha. how much you're going to pump up, but the, the, everything else previous to that is pretty much the same. It's just like the last three days, everything changes. Um, I remember when I was at my peak of training, I feel I'm a lot more into yoga right now, but I had this whole powerlifting phase. Then I entered like a bit of a, let's focus on hypertrophy kind of phase. I'd often see that even peer reviewed studies uh, get updated really, really often. Like every two years, they figure that this is the new rep range that's ideal for building muscle. No, this is the new rep range. And it keeps kind of changing a little bit. Like I remember back in the day, uh, we were always told to stick between eight and 16 reps. And there are studies now that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you know Andrew Huberman. Yeah. Um, so incredible yeah. podcast. And yeah. it's a big podcast recommendation for anyone who's into biology generally. 
um i was listening to a muscle centric podcast of andrew huberman now there's a study that says that you can even go up to like 30 reps and you'll still gain hypertrophy yeah i think brad schofield put out right. that paper yes right uh yeah and I, that's what i've been doing for many many years i want to ask you that because you spoke about how your exercise program even for different clients is sort of the same so you know if you're comfortable with it i'd sure. love to know um kind of what rep ranges you follow for your uh clients and if you could give like a general kind of breakdown of your bodybuilding plan uh there's a lot of people who are going to copy it but sure. i feel you can never actually copy the trainer because the trainer brings his or her own energy to the uh to the mix but chris gethin let us know <laughs> okay yeah the rep range that i generally work in with my clients are between 10 and 50 repetitions 50 50 wow yeah. so i started a training principle many years ago called, called dtp and i started that out of accident because i'd had so many injuries mostly from racing motocross years ago and i was dealing with so much inflammation that i thought well look i can't stop training i don't want to stop training because it's mentally therapeutic for me uh what if i just start going higher reps and lighter weight so i would brother what is dtp like what is it, it stands for dramatic transformation principle gotcha and there was no name to it back then i just started doing it but then more and more people wanted to follow it so then i i named it and uh so i would train to absolute failure meaning that i couldn't do one more rep even if my life depended on it around 50 repetitions and then as that joint or tendon felt a little bit better the next week i'd increase the weight and go for 40 repetitions and then the next week it'd be 50 40 30 then a week after that if i felt good you know 50 40 30 20 and so on and so forth and then once i got down to my heaviest weight i'd go tw- I'd reverse so I'd do 10 reps mm. and then 20 and then 30 and then 40 and 50 but rest in for several minutes between these sets you know and for just several choosing. minutes uh yeah maybe 2 to 3 minutes okay. you know usually on the lower rep range I would rest for about 3 minutes on the higher rep range I'd rest for about a minute gotcha I could talk about that but we would have to get a little bit of scientific no, you go for it okay yeah. all right so with the high rep range you're relying on glycolytic energy carbohydrates glycogen so you've got a pool of them providing that you're eating plenty of carbohydrates they'll get stored in your muscle in your liver so you've got plenty resources there so you can shorten the rest periods and keep pushing between these sets it burns you know you get a massive lactic acid build up but it creates what's called sarcoplasmic hypertrophy that will really shuttle fluid into the muscle stretch the fascia which is the webbing that prevents the muscle from growing obviously we don't want that we want it to grow and then as you go to the lower rep range now we're relying on ATP adenosine triphosphate okay now that can only replenish itself over time so that's why you'd rest for about several minutes that's why you'll get a lot of bodybuilders using creatine because that provides energy to the ATP resources okay so we lengthen that rest period usually at that time so with with my clients I'll put them through DTP not all the time we did DTP today with Riddick and that will generally look like this so for shoulder press uh we did the Arnold press to begin with uh we did 30 reps then 25 reps then 20 then 15 then 10 then i went to the conventional shoulder press and then we went 10 15 uh 20 25 and 30 okay so you know we're targeting both our fast twitch muscle fibers and slow twitch muscle fibers so as you said you know the brad scofield's research is now showing that you can build muscle with higher reps but we know that you can build it with lower reps so why leave any stone unturned yeah. why not do them all correct me if i'm wrong what's the other kind of hypertrophy other than sarcoplasmic there's one more oh myofibula 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 so that's, that's that's through targeting your fast twitch muscle fibers gotcha so what you're basically saying is uh okay hold on we we got to dial back a little bit sure. to break down the science uh, here because this was very helpful for me when i used to train so correct me wherever i'm wrong uh is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy like your muscles are built up of fibers and the volume of each of those fibers kind of grows a little bit Uh no that's going to be more the fluid within the fibers okay. 
So you're going to have this sarcoplasmic fluid, and that's what expands the fiber and expands through then the fascia, that sh that webbing that prevents the muscle from growing further and further and further. So you're able to stretch that a little bit more. So with that, you're really working on the pump as much as you possibly can. So it feels like your skin is splitting. Mm. That's what you get with high repetitions and short rest periods, providing that you're hydrated, you know, and providing that you've got plenty of uh, carbohydrates, glycogen mm. in your system. And is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy the key for the way you look? Um, I'd say it's both. It's not one or the other because with my fibular hypertrophy, then that is going to expand the fibers more. Okay, so you're working at sarcoplasmic, the fluid and the fascia, and then you've got the myofibula, which has got to be more so the expansion of the fibers as they're being engaged through heavy weights. It's kind of like you thinking of muscles like a sort of a pipe. Yeah. Uh, and so myofibril uh, hypertrophy will increase the volume of the pipe and yeah. sarcoplasmic will fill it with fluid. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And is it correct to say that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and hypertrophy for those people who lost here means like growth in the size of your muscles, which is basically what most people want. Uh, is it correct to say that higher reps will help with your sarcoplasmic hypertrophy? Yes. Lower reps help with myofibril hypertrophy. You got it. But when you combine the two, they both benefit each other. And it's not just 2xing your hypertrophy. It's probably like 2.5 or 3xing it. Yeah. And I think more than anything, it provides more longevity to the person. Because when you're starting off with high repetitions, you're now warming up the joints. You're putting synovial fluid, which is like a lubricant, into the joints. Uh, there isn't very good blood flow to the tendons and ligaments, so you're actually warming up those areas whilst you're working the muscles. So it's kind of like a warm-up, however, it's to failure. So you, it's a very efficient way of working out as well. And, you know, our bodies go through wear and tear. Mm. We all age, and there's only so many clicks of that pen that we get before it stops clicking. So we want to ensure that we can expand that. We improve our longevity without actually getting old. Man, I'm... Um genuinely enjoying this conversation with you so much um let's go deeper into the science a little bit here sure. um all right so i've got to ask you this from my own personal experience and from speaking to a lot of friends um uh, stretching mobility yoga these things are kind of coming to the forefront all over the world in the world of health i have noticed that friends of mine who practice specific forms of yoga where it is a little bit strength based it actually benefits the way their frame looks uh, overall. Like if they combine it with weight training, you 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 have to kind of do weight training. That's the base of it. But you do get these slight visual benefits when you also focus on your flexibility, also focus on your mobility. Let's keep Ritik Roshan in mind for this. Okay. Now he's a fucking amazing dancer. Like in order to be that level of a dancer, you have to be extremely flexible. And I'm sure that he does some flexibility work to maintain that level of flexibility at his age. He was, what, like 45-ish? Same age as me, uh, 48. That, that's crazy. And he's still a fantastic dancer. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure he's done a lot of flexibility work. And I'm sure that adds something to the training program. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know his body the best. And I want to know the science of this, if there is any. Uh, and even if there's not a peer-reviewed study yet, would you believe that higher flexibility and higher mobility actually changes the shape of your body. Because I, I used to see this with guys in my gym as well. The ones who didn't do any mobility work, they're clearly like really stiff. I feel like the end product with their bodies also wasn't as good as the people who actually focused on the mobility and flexibility. So what do you think? So there isn't a right or wrong answer to that. So when you're looking at somebody like, for instance, a Riddick who needs to dance, who needs to do uh, stunts, well, he used to do his own stunts, a lot of action scenes, there needs to be a lot of flexibility. And with the amount of injuries that that guy has had over the years, he needs to be very flexible. So he spends nearly as much time f uh, with flexibility, mobility, and muscle activation as he does training every single day. Like it was probably about 45 minutes of stretching this morning wow. before his lifting session, you know, and the lifting session was an hour. So he, he is very, he's religious about that. 
Now, does that change the way that his physique looks? I don't know, because like I know a lot of bodybuilders and powerlifters who don't do any flexibility because they feel it compromises them when they're lifting extremely heavy weights. They don't feel like they're stuck in a groove when they're doing a heavy deadlift or a bench press or anything like that because they're too mobile. They feel like they need to be fixed in to a certain degree. Is there science behind that? Uh, yeah, so there are, is some science that shows that if you do any uh, like stretching or PNF stretching or anything like that prior to working out, it can decrease your strength. However, you could look at the other side of the coin and go, doesn't matter if my strength has decreased a little bit. I just want to look good and feel good and not get injured. You know, so there's two sides to that coin. But if you look at like the top bodybuilders on the Olympia stage today, for instance, I don't think many of them are really stretching that much. There's a couple that I know, like there's a guy called um, a Hunter Labrada, who's probably going to be top five in the Olympia this year. He stretches religiously before his workouts, but he's one of the very, very few guys of that size that actually does. Mm, okay, fair enough. Uh, do you think there's more research to be done in this? Yeah, probably for sure. Yeah, mm. I'd like to see a lot more research. Like I stretch in between every single one of my sets. I'll do a little bit of mass muscle activation before my workouts, especially on larger muscle groups like legs, and it definitely helps me. You know, I feel that, you know, we're talking about stretching the muscle fascia uh, through blood flow. Well, if you can stretch the fascia through extreme stretching as well and manipulation through massage, then it can only benefit, I believe. Mm. You look gorgeous, by the way, as in like your skin, all that, dude. You look so much younger than like 48. Like, I don't know if the camera catches it, but Depends you look like got a soft lens. <laughs> <laughs> but you look like about like 35, 34. Thank uh, you. You know, it's, it's crazy. Wow. I've, I've got, um, I, so I do it like my goal now is not so much like trying to pack on size. It is at this moment because I've got a, a project for next year. But my goal now is just longevity. And that's what I try to do with my clients. What now. does that mean? So in increase my health span. You mm. know, I, I think as we get a little bit older, we get a bit wiser. We face mortality and we realize, okay, I want to be here longer. And it helps if you've got a partner that's like 15 years younger than you as well. <laughs> so, okay, I got to be around here. Um, so, you know, I really focus on everything that I do because I know bodybuilding or, you know, extreme athleticism, because I participate in quite a few different sports, causes a lot of inflammation. It can cause aging, even though we look good, we've got abs, we don't know what's really going on in the inside. And if you're overtraining, you're, you're training really hard, it can shorten your lifespan. Mm -hmm. So I focus on everything that I can, and same with my clients, like with meditation, managing stress, making sure that the food that you're eating is very clean, it's non-inflammatory, same with supplements, going to bed really early, blocking artificial blue lights with blue light blocking glasses, mm. grounding myself, taking my shoes and socks off and going down to the beach, being open with nature, you know, mm. things like that is very, very important. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from ancestral wisdom and uh, combining it with today's technology and biohacking. So that's, that's my goal. So I have my biological age tested every single year and I've been able to reduce it now for the past seven years. So my biological age now is 26. Wow. When I started, it was two years older than my actual chronological age. So I've been able to reverse that process every year. How, how do you even like measure the biological age? Is it like there's, a there's, body test? There's various ways that you can test it. Yeah, through blood and saliva. So there's uh, one is called like a methylation test. Then there's another one called uh, a glycan age test. You have glycans in your body and you have this mitochondria, you know, which is your energy furnace that provides every cell in your body energy. What's, what's the glycan? Like glycan. So you have glycans in your body that can dictate your chronological age. Same, and there's another one, it's called telomeres. So think of like uh, telomeres as like, you know, the sh this is a, the popular analogy. Think of your shoelace, mm. and then over the years, sometimes it starts to fray and then get mm. shorter and shorter. That's what happens with your telomeres mm. in your body. And they use that measurement to dictate your biological age because if, if that frays more and more, they've been able to see that that is part of the aging process. So you're trying to prevent that or possibly reverse that. How, how do you reverse it? Like you said that you've uh, been able to do it for six or seven years. I'm assuming that sleep is something you're focusing massive, on. Massive. And what else? That's why I go to bed at 7.30 <laughs> in the evening and uh, don't mingle with many people. Um, but uh, so for a couple of hours before bed, I'll 
block out all artificial blue light with red lens, uh, blue light blocking glasses, because you know, you think of our ancestors that go to bed with a uh, campfire or mm. candlelight and then they'd go to bed. Now we have screens, we have uh, artificial light bulbs that's emitting blue light. We have computer, we have phone, we have TV, cinema, that's keeping us awake. That raises our cortisol levels when our melatonin should be released. Mm. If cortisol is high, we cannot release melatonin, we can't lull ourselves to sleep. And sleep has been shown as like the biggest dictator for longevity. You know, mm. if we're not recovering, we're not performing, not only from a physical aspect, but from a life aspect. Mm. Uh, I'll make sure that I ground myself every day. So, you know, I, I do wear earthing shoes, so they actually earth with the ground, if that makes sense. Or, you know, whenever possible, take your shoes and socks off because now, you know, we're exposed to so many EMFs, satellite signals, dirty electricity. It's very important that whatever penetrates us actually passes through us mm. so we can absorb the negative eons uh, from the earth. So, you know, like the, the fanny pack that I've got there, that is a, an EMF blocking wow. fanny pack. And I have an EMF blocking phone case. And in my hotel room, I've got like an EMF pollutant scrambler because obviously I'm exposed to a lot of EMF in a hotel. So, uh, you know, I even have uh, the clothing that I'll wear that blocks EMFs when I'm on planes and stuff like that because I'm so exposed. And whenever possible, I'm eating humane raised, organic, grass fed, wild caught, because the majority of the antibiotics that we consume today is not through pharmaceuticals. It's what the food is eating, the mm. antibiotics that the fish are fed, you know, especially in a factory farmed mm. uh, uh, census. And uh, some of the more extreme biohacks that I've done is like stem cells. I've had stem cells. I've flown overseas uh, to get stem cells on a couple of occasions now, because as we get a little bit older, our stem cells decrease and that is what allows our body to recover especially from a physical standpoint as well through connective tissue cartilage hair eyes skin how how expensive was it it was quite expensive but it was less than half the price that i'd get in the us and it's more efficacious when you go to places like mexico panama colombia because they are allowed to harvest the stem cells over say a two-week period they can't do that by law in somewhere in the us so you get much more stem cells but much cheaper but it cost twenty thousand dollars wow. for me to have that done you know but i had that done primarily for injuries but it can prevent the onset of aging as well mm. you know like i tore a snowboard in a year and a half ago and i tore 68 percent of my tricep off the bone what the f bro? yeah so i had to have that reattached <laughs> the, the surgery was more painful than the than the actual, uh, th than me tearing it. You know, I tore it, I knew immediately it'd come off. You know, I could feel it was just hanging it. But um, I'd had, I've had so many injuries since I was a kid. I was like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And it was on Valentine's Day. So I was like, well, I'm not gonna go to the hospital now. I booked a seat, I booked a table and they had bone marrow there and I love bone marrow. <laughs> so I went to the hotel and I got, you know, the string that you get from the robe and I strapped my arm straight and we went out and had dinner. And uh, that was okay. It was just the next, when I had to have surgery, because I had to drill through the femur and the humerus to reattach the tendons. I was a little bit gnarly. So I went and had stem cells after to help with the healing. What does it feel like? It just hangs off. It's just soft. And uh, I've torn it a couple of times internally since then, not in the gym. I never, t I never tear things in the gym. It's always outside because I do extreme stuff. Uh, but like I, I feel it bleeding inside. You can actually, you, it's weird. You always look down and you're like, there should be blood there. Cause like you could feel it trickling down, but it's not, it's nothing there because it's bleeding internally. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bizarre. Like I was at Riddick's gym the other day and the toilet lid was kind of loose and it like almost fell off. So I went to grab it and I felt it pull then. It's always things like that. It's nothing heroic. It's always <laughs> things like that. I'm like, jeez. Yeah, I felt my <laughs> tricep go again. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about the stem cell stuff again. Yeah, you, yeah. you spoke about harvesting stem cells. I don't mind if you'd get into the basics of it because as far as I understand, uh, I'm not sure if stem cells are entirely lab made, right? Like they use um, embryo cells. Yeah, yeah, embryonic. Uh, so how does that actually work? Like I'm assuming there's an embryo inside a lady's stomach and they're able to harvest some of the cells from that embryo? Yeah, so there's different ways you can get stem cells. So you can have your own stem cells extracted from like your bone marrow okay. or your body fat. Body fat isn't really that good. 
Um, but the thing is, I'm not really interested in that because that's only be really as good as my own stem cells are. Have you done it? Stem cells? No, no, like extracting it. No, 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 no. Don't bother with that. I'm assuming that would be really painful. Yeah, it can't. I've, I know a few people that have had it done. You usually get it withdrawn from your spine or something. What the f***? Yeah, and it can be quite painful. A good friend of mine who was in India with me a, a few years ago, actually, Ben Greenfield. Yeah. He had it done there. Okay. And uh, yeah, but I, I think it's so much better if you can actually go for like the umbilical stem cell so they can extract the stem cells from the umbilical cord of a of a of a baby and you'd go to a places like Colombia or whatever where they they store the stem cells usually for that family so if that family ever needs stem cell or that baby as an adult needs stem cells they've got a bank there okay quite a few people do this uh, but then they will donate so many of those stem cells to someone like me okay and then in return they'll allow those patients to have their stem cells banked for free. Okay, and that's kind of how it works. And uh, they can actually harvest those stem cells, so 20 million could turn into 200 million in a lab mm. from, from those stem cells. It, it grows like fungus or something? I don't know actually how it grows. I've never really seen it. But uh, I, 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 well, it's on a Petri dish, and that's kind of how it grows. Mm. Okay, uh, so... How did they put it inside your body then? They injected it into your bloodstream straight away? Yeah, so the last time that I had it done uh, was in Mexico at the Chipsa Hospital. So Chipsa Hospital is one of the leading cancer hospitals uh, that, that, that practices like Gerson therapy. And so the surgeons there are very used to injecting like cancerous tumors, which are very vascular. So they have to be pinpoint accurate at injecting these tumors, obviously. So they have to use uh, ultrasound to see exactly where they're injecting. So then I, sh you would show them, and I did, I showed them x-rays and MRIs prior to visiting and told them exactly where I'm feeling the discomfort. Let's say if it's in my knee, shoulder, tricep, wherever. And then when I'm there, that's exactly where they'll inject maybe once, maybe four times to a certain area, maybe into the joint socket, maybe to the tendon surrounding. And then you cannot train, you cannot do any activity or hard activity for about three months after because the stem cells go towards the trauma. But let's say if I go to the gym and hit bench press, I'm creating more trauma. So the stem cells are going to go there. Fuck. So you have to have them stabilized to the certain areas that you're working. And that's why it's very good if you go to a reputable place, they will put you in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber straight after. Then you do something that's called PEMF, which is pulsed electronic magnetic field therapy. You'll do a blood transfusion of ozone therapy. Um, so all of these things really help detox the body, get rid of a lot of senescent cells, which are like dead zombie-like cells in your body. And uh, it will help stabilize and proliferate those stem cells so they're that much more stabilized in your body. What does it feel like after you're done with it? Painful. You know, you're really? stiff. Because they're putting in needles that are several inches long into your joints, you know. And uh, so from that, you're going to be sore. You know, you're walking peg-legged for the next couple of days. Really? Yeah. Okay. And uh, straight, I mean, transparent question. Rich people all over the world are doing these things now. Yeah, a lot of a lot of athletes do it. So okay. you know, I followed the UFC. Uh, I've trained a few a few fighters, and a lot of them get it done. A lot of top wrestlers go and like a, one of the top wrestlers uh, was with me when I was getting my stem cells done. Now a lot of top athletes, basketball players, uh, they all go get them done because you know sometimes they're getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars for a season, so they need to continue to play. Yeah, uh, I mean, you don't have to name anyone if you don't feel like, but I'd love to know what it's like training a UFC athlete because their bodies are put through so much wear and tear yeah. that it kind of changes their biology. So even if you're training with them or you're training them as clients, how is it different training their body? Because it must be crazy different focusing on hypertrophy for body Bollywood stars. Oh, yeah, and then on sure. the other end, you're training them for sports-specific training. You're, what is it like training them firstly? What are their bodies like? What are their mentalities like? And what do they need from a trainer? Yeah, okay. So their mentality is usually very, very strong. But sometimes it can be, it can be a little bit too relaxed. Really? Uh, yeah, because, you know, they could be getting ready for a fight. And they're going, you know what? Because of some, they have to make weight. And they're like, well, I can lose it all in the last week because that's what they've always done through a lot of dehydration. You cannot rehydrate in 24 hours properly. 
uh, before a fight, unless you're taking IVs, and now that's illegal, so you can't do an IV of uh, f uh, fluid now. So a, a lot of it is kind of prehistoric. So when you come in with a new point of view, it can be a little bit difficult if that person has just won world championships without that. So everybody's going to be a little bit different. But the, the perspective is usually I'm not there to improve them as a fighter. I'm there to improve their strength and conditioning. The fight coach does his job. I just improve the strength and conditioning of when, the athletes. When you say strength and conditioning specifically for an MMA fighter, it's strength in order to throw a heavier punch or a kick or to hold down someone when you're grappling. Yeah, it's very explosive. Okay. So all the work has to be explosive. So with, for instance, an actor, I'm getting them to do a controlled movement. Okay, we count the negative. With a fighter, it's you push that resistance as fast as you possibly can because chest is a punching punching muscle, same as your triceps, same as your shoulders. So we have to engage as many muscle fibers as fast, as quick, and as many as possible. Mm. So it's very explosive movements. And then from a conditioning standpoint, have to just work through pushing through lactic acid thresholds where usually you'd stop at 12 reps. Okay, we got a good pump or whatever. It's like, okay, we're going to do 30 reps. Then we're going to drop the weights and do another 30. And then another 30, another 30. And then we're going to go for some sprints. Mm. You know, it's, it's very different. It's like pushing the body to its absolute max. So there's customization based on the person and their systems. But whenever you're training an MMA fighter, it's always about training them for power and explosivity. Yes. I'm assuming it's the same with other sports as well. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, you know, again, you know, more sprinting, more combat sports, you know, whereas if you look at something else like long distance running, ultra marathon, uh, Ironman triathlon, that's very, very different again. You know, mm. that's more, okay, endurance based. Now we've got to train a lot going long and slow, you know, because sometimes you have to be in the gray zones of recovery or explosiveness. So what rep range will you take if you're training someone for a marathon? usually very, very low, funnily enough. Okay. Um, because like I've done some ultra marathons myself. I've done Ironman triathlon and I made the mistake of thinking, okay, if I do high reps, then that should replicate itself to my run, you know, because I'll be running for high reps. But I noticed that I overtrained very, very quickly. I just was not recovering. So then I brought down the volume of my rep range from, say, 25, 30 down to 8 to 10s. And I was able to recover that much faster. So I think it's very important that you don't have a crossover of these systems. We are training both of them all every day. You know, mm. it's like, okay, we do one for weight training and one is completely different for endurance. When you go into that rep range of like 50, 100, does it have hypertrophy benefits? Oh yeah, for sure. Like for you think sure. your muscles will grow bigger? No doubt about it. 100%. It all comes down to the intensity that you're willing to apply. Mm. Like some people could go through that process and go, well, I didn't build any muscle. Well, the thing is about 1% of the population that train, train hard. Really? But the 99% are convinced that they train hard. Let's talk about fucking training hard. What does that mean? Is that the mind-muscle connection angle? Is it the mentality while training? And I'll tell you why I say this. Um, I started playing football like three years back to cope with a breakup. And it was the best decision I ever made for myself because it gives you so much mental peace when you're engaged in sport. Um, I started getting injured like in football. You know, I just like twist my ankle and I realized my body's too rigid. But that got me into stretching and yoga. And the stretching kind of helped my healing as well. Mm. I don't know how. Yeah, I've heard that from f a few people. E even my skin, my hair, all of it, like just everything changed. Uh, and I wasn't even doing proper yoga. I was doing like sports stretching, you know, just opening up your hip, things like that. Um, benefited me tremendously. Then I gradually started getting into a bit of yoga. And the rule with yoga is that when you're stretching, especially when you're intense stretches, you try not listening to music or podcasts or anything. Mm. And you need to be just in the stretch. That's when I really started seeing the difference in my own flexibility or openness of my body. And I figured that let me apply it to weight training as well. And then I started seeing benefits there as well. I just felt like my muscles were responding better. My recovery was better when I was completely engaged in the workout. Is this what you mean? 
Yeah, for sure. You know, you have to, well, that's one of the parts because you ne need to have that mind muscle connection where you are focusing and visualize, visualizing the anatomy and the physiology of the muscle as you're training it. So a lot of the time, if I'm training someone, I'm t especially on their posterior chains, such as their rear delts, their back, their hamstrings, people are pretty good at training their mirror muscles. The ones that they see, those are the ones that grow. Mm. So I'm always poking the muscle that that person is trying to train to activate that neuromuscular pathway, their senses are go, okay, I'm, I'm working this muscle group. So that's very important. And then finding failure in the gym is the only place that will find success. Do you, do you train all your clients to failure in like? Everybody. Okay. Everybody, because that's the only stimuli that's going to allow the body to change. Um, so for people who don't know what failure means, I'm actually going to let Chris explain it. Go ahead, man. I'm embarrassed to like explain anything. <laughs> <what I'm saying laughs> you carry on, bud. So failure is um, you know pe performing one more rep, even if your life depended on it, mm. or as if your life depended on it. So if you think about a time where you've been maybe under the water and you cannot breathe, you cannot get to the surface quick enough, you are desperate. That's how desperate you need to be for completing that last repetition where it's really uncomfortable and a lot of people stop before then because they're used to more comfort mm. so that's where the one percent are made in training to absolute failure you know people get a little bit too scientific they overcomplicate things they're like oh the, you know your legs need to be at this angle when you're doing a squat or your calves need to be and it's like, just push, man, just push, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, it all comes down to how bad you really want it. And if you are as desperate for that last repetition as you are to breathe, then you'll get it. If you think that you can mess around on your phone and have a chat with other people in the gym and then train fucking hard, you're not training hard, man. You know, mm. as soon as you finish that set, you should be focused and psyching yourself up for that next set. You know, you don't mm. have time for distraction. That is your work. Yeah. That is where you've got to find that success. And it's through the sacrifice. Yeah. But not many people are willing to make that type of sacrifice. They've just convinced themselves that they already are. Yeah. We had a Shaolin warrior monk on the show as well. Nice. And uh, he spoke about exercise-based meditation, which basically means exactly what you said. Like you're saying it in a different way, but it's exactly what you said, that you give your body 15 minutes at least every day at least in his school. Yeah. I look at it as like 45 minutes-ish where you're just engaged with your body. Nothing about your career, nothing yeah. about your breakups, nothing even about family. It's just you and your body. It's an extremely primal activity for you to do. Yeah. The outcome is definitely better hypertrophy, better strength, all that. But it's very important for a human being's mind. It's kind of like a flush out of everything else other than your body which is what you're supposed to take care of for longevity, et cetera, et cetera. But it's definitely a form of meditation that keeps your mental health in check as well in the long term because yeah. you're switching off from everything else other than the muscles you're targeting. Yeah, I think it's very important. That's why people should meditate. You know, I meditate twice a day. Riddick's meditating twice a day. I've got a meditation instructor while I'm here now mm. in India as well. I've got my apps and everything, but, you know, you can't replace that going down to the beach first thing in the morning because we're so used to distraction. You know, mm. you only go out to eat and you see couples there. As soon as one couple has gone to the toilet, the other one is on the phone straight away because they're used to that distraction. The phone's a drug, you know, where if you start to meditate, like I went on a 10-day Vipassana recently, no phone, no computer, can't make eye contact, can't read, can't speak. I was just focused on myself and my own senses instead of the auxiliary senses outside. And I find that a lot of people are just so consumed by distraction that they can't train properly without the distraction of the thoughts in their mind, thinking about the breakup or, you know, work or whatever it may be, as opposed to on themselves. And that's where the magic happens through that visualization. Like when I was really serious into training, I would visualize the clothes that I was going to wear for leg day, <laughs> how the steel, the iron would feel in my hands based on the temperature of that time of year. You know, just picture it. So all I had to do when I got there was go through the motions because I've done the hard work, which is up here. The body follows, you know, people can talk about genetics and all that sort of stuff. You know, they talk about steroids. That's your steroid, your head, your brain, the mindset that you put yourself in. And that goes for anything, you know, whether you're in the military, whether you're trying to build a career or whether you're trying to build your physique. Mm. No, bro, that's easy. I want to know about uh, your Vipassana experience. 
um we have international listeners as well so if you could explain what the basics of vipassana i'm sure a lot of indian listeners know but uh, i wasn't expecting you to say that that you've gone for a 10 day course but you know when someone speaks to you in person uh they do sense this energy from you which is not there online and i've been following you for ages i also feel you're a very different man now yeah for sure uh, 100% but i'd love to know about what vipassana did to your mind man because i know so many of my friends who need it uh but are not willing to go because of the silence involved the whole concept of not speaking so could you explain the basics and then explain what it did for you as a human being and then maybe even you know what impact it had on your fitness sure well i, I did this in the us but uh it was it, it's basically the uh, the teacher sn goenka is here from mumbai and his uh school is about an hour and a half away from me i'm i'm yeah. dying to visit there yeah. because now i'm considered an old student i can go there for a 3 day uh 3 <laughs> day vipassana uh but you have to start off with a 10 day so the 10 day is basically you have to you, you have to go through an application process they don't accept anyone and uh and then when accepted you have to give up your phone you give up your any writing material computer anything like that you're not allowed to make eye contact during that time you are only having two small vegetarian meals a day you fast for about 18 and a half hours every day no eye contact no speaking um nothing you are just meditating from 4:30 in the morning until 9 o'clock in the evening you uh-huh. have a couple of breaks um which is good and uh, i knew going in that yeah i'm going to face a vision the vision is i don't want to be here this is boring this is stupid why did i do this you know that's the primitive mind uh not wanting to do that and i knew that there'd be a craving that craving is look get me out here i need social interaction i need to read something like i remember i had my tooth paste i probably read like 18 times you know because mm. i needed to read something mm. and uh, but after about 4 days of that battle you kind of get over it and now you are heightened with your senses you realize the walk that you've been taken to the meditation school from your sleeping quarters you realize things that you never realized before like i could hear the grass through the wind the wind brushing through the grass there's things that i'd notice on that walk that i'd never noticed before because we've always got the blinders on and our senses have become so shut off and dampened from the noise from the sounds from the sights from the smells everything and then just being alone so you can actually for once hear your own voice in your head in your thoughts with clarity is absolutely unbelievable it's really really good but coming back into society was very difficult you know <laughs> because you know like i remember going into a gas station on the way back and the lights and there's music playing and there's kids in there and i was like i cannot handle this it's mm. too much too soon and i remember going to the vipassana which is about a uh, 4 hour drive for me had the music play and all that sort of stuff i just wanted silence on the way back on the way there i didn't notice the mountains on the way back i'm noticing the beauty in the mountains and noticing the beauty in the small things and appreciating so many of the small things that we usually take for granted and appreciating life you know the lifeline that we've been given and not taking that for uh, granted and that's why one of the reasons why I'm working so much on increasing my health span and my longevity and my health because of course I'm going to get old but I don't want to be elderly in a process where someone has to take care of me you know I've got some sort of disability because our lives are very very valuable and uh I think it's very important to do something like a vipassana for those that are just focusing on work focusing on the next year focusing on the career the woman whatever you need to focus on yourself mm. a little bit more to ground yourself yeah um you know speaking about grounding yourself when you actually get into what vipassana entails it's extremely mathematical uh i don't know the exact technique because i've not really done a course the way you have but it's something like for these for this much time you have to focus on your breath and for this much time you have to focus on something else Am yeah I mean? so you start off with a larger sort of triangle around the bottom of your lips over your nose 
like the mask. You know, yeah. you focus on your breath around this area and the senses around this area. And as you get a little bit better, you focus on closing that gap until you just focus in on the inside of your nostril. And then you go through a scanning process, starting with the top of the head, going down. If you get distracted by any thought whatsoever, you start again. Mm. And if you get down to say your eyes, you go back and start again at the top. And, you know, you train yourself not to get distracted, you know, and that's the hardest part because we're so used to it. You know, if you ask, you know, when I do my seminars, I always ask people, has anybody meditated? Everyone puts out their hand. And then I ask them, do you meditate? Hardly anyone puts up their hands because it's difficult. Yeah. It's hard. But it's just like, you know, if you're training, maybe it's going to take several months for you to see any results. And it's the same with learning a language or meditating. Yeah. You know, you just got to be consistent with it to actually get anything from it. But um, Mr. S. N. Guenka is just a phenomenal teacher and he's there through the TV and through the audio at some occasion teaching. And I, it really, really did help. Uh, but then the rest of the time that you, you're just in silence. Yeah, I think that's the big joy and benefit of meditation that young people, especially college students, teenagers fail to understand. That, you know, when you see a really, really sharp knife where someone's handing you a sharp knife and they say, okay, don't touch that side because you'll cut yourself very easily. Your mind is capable of becoming that knife if you're able to engage yourself in the grind, which is meditation. Mm. And people think that when you meditate, uh, it's boring and I, you, you'll get negative thoughts and your mind will run places and all that's okay. It's, it's supposed to happen. It's yeah. like your mind flushing out the thoughts. Yes, exactly. Uh, and your job is to just pull it back to the point of focus, which could be how in Vipassana they focus on the breath and the movement of uh, consciousness. It could be a mantra. It could be something else. It could be a chant you're doing. But bringing it back to that single point of focus sharpens that knife, which is your mind. And once your mind is like that much sharper, you're able to apply it in the gym, in your career, uh, in your relationship. Uh, and we had a, we had a Sri Lankan monk, his name was Dandapani. And I've spoken to him about this concept exactly that this is what mindfulness and meditation brings to your life, that your knife for life becomes sharp. And he's like, yeah, that's true. But also when you're in moments of happiness, you're able to focus on the happiness much more and extract the happiness. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because you're that much more in any particular moment and you're present. Yeah. And very few of us are present. You know, if we're having a conversation with someone, we're usually waiting for them to finish so we can talk as mm. opposed to really listening, shutting out all the distraction, making the eye contact and being present yeah. in that particular moment. And that's why I think a lot of people go, wow, that year went so quick. Well, last five years, I remember when the album came out because no one's present. Yeah. And it's the same when we're eating our meals. You know, we're talking about the mind-muscle connection. I get my clients to really focus on slowing down when they're eating their meals. There's a great book out there called uh, The Slow Down Diet, where we are appreciated, we appreciate the color of the food, the texture of the food when it's in our mouth, how many hands it went through to get onto our plate, and what it's going to do for us, provide us energy, antioxidants, polyphenols for our skin, here, whatever. It's our lifeline, you know? Yeah. And then you appreciate and you feel more fulfilled because a lot of people are eating distracted. Once they've finished eating that meal, they're like, what else can I eat? Yeah. And people are overeating because they haven't acknowledged what they've eaten. 100% man. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you something. I've spoken about it on the show a lot. Uh, I was one of those people who really looked down upon meditation and yoga. You know, I thought, because again, I was, I was very much into my weight training, my powerlifting. And I was single. Uh, I mean, there, there was the single pointed focus I had towards like powerlifting and getting my numbers up. Uh, and then at age 22, ayahuasca happened to me. <laughs> was that in India? No, no, it was, it just came to me, man. I right. didn't go out looking for it. Like I was in Seychelles and I met a shaman on the beach. Yeah. And he tried convincing me to do it. And I was fighting the thought. I was like, no, no I'm not going to do this shit. And uh, that night when I was sleeping, I had a dream. Where I just felt like some higher power told me, do it. I did it the next day. And it was the single most important life experience I've had. Like everything switched up. Like I came out a new person. And recently I've had another kind of shamanic experience. It wasn't ayahuasca. It was psilocybin. Oh yeah, yeah. But with a shaman. Yeah. And that changed me as well. That gave me the empathy that I was missing. Especially towards my family. Because with content, you have empathy, you know, towards your audience. You have empathy towards your team because they're building it with you. But that empathy is kind of coming from somewhere. And I was withdrawing it from my family. Mm. So I feel like it didn't just uh, 
turn back this empathy I'm giving in the forward direction. It added more empathy to my heart so that I can give it in the forward and the backward direction to my family. So both these experiences have been very life changing. Now, parallelly, um, I've been questioning the meaning of this kind of grind a lot in terms of this is a lot of work to be generating so many podcasts, to be doing social media, to be doing businesses. Uh, a couple of years back, I began working on a meditation app. Uh, for the last year, we've really been working on it. And I've still been questioning things because it's a lot of work there as well. But I just figured that when I was training people, there was a lot I was doing for people in that one hour session. You know, in terms of, <clears throat> I wasn't only like training their bodies, but I was adding something to their mind as well. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that at scale. So the psilocybin actually showed me that the, the meditation you're putting out there, it's to convince versions of you who are younger than you in this world that things like meditation things like mindfulness add a lot to your existence interesting not everyone's going to get access to ayahuasca and psilocybin to understand that everyone has access to technology and apps and you can do so much more when you do it at scale um have you ever had any experience like that uh, uh, like, with, with plant medicine and yeah, stuff? yeah, plant yeah. Medicine. yeah i actually went to Colombia and did ayahuasca some years ago, uh, I didn't have the effect that a lot of people did there. You know, people, you know, I was there for five, seven days, but we did the ayahuasca over five days. And some people had life changing or four days. Some people had life changing experiences after the first day. You know, I saw a lot of people there, people from around the world didn't have that effect on me. Um, and I kept getting more cups as the days progressed and it just wasn't getting the effect as a lot of people were. And they said that because I've grown up with so much control, wanting control, that I wasn't able to let myself go in that scenario. I've done psilocybin as well, but I found out that I think there's a compound within me that doesn't allow the psilocybin to have a positive effect because it releases too much dopamine in my brain. However, I can do LSD. So I've done, I do a lot of LSD on micro dosing scale because that helps with uh, preventing so much dopamine yeah. being released. I, I just want to put a disclaimer. This is not recreational at all. And we're not like talking about drugs here. This is from a neuro neurology perspective. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And it, it can help, you know, with PTSD. It can help with depression. And if you have some sort of uh, hormonal imbalances, everybody's different. That's why you've got to have your blood work done before you look into anything like this because it could have a negative effect on some people then, you know, th then that's why I do it. And uh, the most profound effect that I had uh, was ketamine therapy. And I did this in a uh, clinical setting, you know, I had, the, had uh, you wouldn't call it a shaman that was there, but I had an instructor that was there who's also my meditation instructor and yoga instructor back in Boise, and that had a very, very positive effect on me. Mm. And that was just, you know, <laughs> in a basement near a busy street, as opposed to going to a luxury place in Colombia where I did uh, the ayahuasca, you know, I was able to get a better effect. But that goes to show that someone like you can do psilocybin and ayahuasca, but that's not going to have a positive effect for someone else. You have to find what your groove is. Are you comfortable talking about the ketamine, ketamine sure, therapy? Sure, of course. Um, because I think ketamine has a very negative connotation for a lot of people. Yeah. They'll categorize it with cocaine and heroin. Yeah. Uh, and anything including ayahuasca and psilocybin can be harmful to you if you do it in excess. Yeah. So uh, any substance, I mean, even, even like brown rice and uh, chicken breast and broccoli can be harmful if you do it in excess. So of course these things can be harmful. Of course they can be addictive. But when you do it with a science-backed, approach with neurologists around with people to guide you things can change radically in your brain mm -hmm. i would love to know what that was like for you my man yes so picture this so i'm in a room i'm lying on uh it's, it's called a pod which is like a large bin uh, bean bag and i've got like a weighted blanket on me with uh, a face mask but beforehand for about an hour with the instructor we're discussing the intention. What is the intention that I want to get from this? Why am I, I'm there? Because you're not doing this for a recreational purpose. You're actually doing this to clear something from your past, from your present, whatever it may be. 
And then you take, you know, it's, then they would actually tell you the amount that you should take of the ketamine. So then you get uh, given the ketamine, which is basically like a lo lozenge. You can actually have it injected as well through really? IV. Yeah. But I took the lozenge where you let that melt underneath your tongue. And then they'd start like the music and start talking through the process of what you're about to experience. And then you experience it and you kind of lose track of time. You're probably under for about two hours, but if you came out and I said it was 20 minutes or eight hours, you probably wouldn't know the difference, <laughs> you know? You lose, you definitely lose track of time. And the only way that I could properly describe it, it wasn't as if that you're seeing like bright colors or you're like you're tripping by any sense. It honestly feels like, and this is the only way that I can describe it, because there's a lot of darkness there is that it feels like someone is just cleaning out all the rubbish in your brain. And that's what all the darkness is, all the toxic buildup that, you know, you build up in your body. Let's say if you're drinking alcohol or having bad polluted uh, air, you know, you're getting rid of all the, the bad thoughts and that toxic buildup in your brain. And that's what all the dark matter is. And then when you come out and there's a clearing, it feels like you can fill your brain now with the thoughts that you want to think. Because a lot of the time we're like, God, why am I thinking this way? I've got a great life. I got a you know great wife, got a good house, got a dog or whatever. But why am I having these thoughts? And it, it allowed me to clear out a lot of those thoughts so I could fill it with the thoughts that I wanted to think. Mm, created space in your mind. Yeah. But yeah. what did you visualize when this was happening? I didn't really visualize anything. It was so much. It was the only way I could describe it is that I saw like a lot of waterfalls but they were made out of like leaves, you know, that was it. There was uh, an occasion where it, it felt like the ocean, but the ocean was all black. But like, you know, where you see the water break and it's all white, like that was like soft, like clouds. That's kind of what I was seeing, you know, it's very difficult where if you were on something like LSD, you're probably going to see loads of bright colors. You're going to probably see faces in the trees. It was nothing like that. It was very soft. It's very relaxing, but it's very dark as well at the same time. When I say dark, I just mean the tone, not the thoughts. Mm. When I was on my ayahuasca and psilocybin experiences, at the peaks of both, I felt the presence of the entities associated with the two. For example, when you're going to do ayahuasca, they say you always feel a feminine entity with yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. Mother ayahuasca. And yeah. Same with psilocybin, you feel, uh, they call it the mushroom. I think for me, it was like a transgender entity. It didn't have a gender. It was just mm. like an entity with me, which was healing. Did you feel that with no, ketamine? No, I didn't Not feel that. I didn't feel that. Okay. I didn't feel that. What I did feel is that I felt a connection, especially with the ayahuasca. I felt a connection with the earth. Felt yeah. the connection. Like I remember looking up at the stars and feeling a connection with the stars because it was outside in a hammock. Uh, feeling a connection with like the trees. Uh, I could almost see the the bloodline within the earth, within the walls. You know, everything was alive. And that's when I felt more of a connection with the universe. Maybe for you, the mother ayahuasca showed up as mother nature. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you, maybe you've brought something to light that I had no idea. I didn't think about that. Mm. Um, did you have like a vivid experience in your ayahuasca session as well because I'll, I'll tell you why i ask you this you actually went to the amazon and did it went to colombia okay uh um, oh, costa rica sorry costa rica colombia was uh, another stem cell experience <laughs> uh how expensive was it in costa rica i actually got that for free okay because they just wanted me to give them an honest review after wow uh and uh i had jerry who's in charge of the facility who's a fascinating character I had him on my podcast. So I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give it a shot because that was something that I was interested in. And a couple of my friends from the biohacking space had already been down there and they just connected us. Mm -hmm. So uh, myself and my partner, we went down there and we did it for the week. And it was only on that last day that I felt an experience really, but it wasn't as life changing as another, other people there where I felt maybe what you said is that connection with mother ayahuasca. Uh, which was nature, mother nature. And, uh, you know, just feeling that connection was really, really amazing. But just see, f seeing the connection with other people during that time, I don't know if you purged where you were throwing up. I didn't have any of that. I didn't have any of those experiences. 
it it didn't happen to me either but i cried a lot and i wasn't sad when i was crying it i knew i was just releasing things yeah. i actually looked at my shaman and asked him why my crying was i'm not feeling sad i'm actually feeling happy was there said, a lot of people there when you were doing it no no it was just me see i think that probably would have been better for me cuz i'm a little bit more of an introvert and i do better around myself as opposed mm. to a lot of people i feel a little bit vulnerable like that there was a lot of people there mm. you know you could hear people over here screaming people over here throwing up and there was one person crying here and i think that probably kept me straight can i tell you something straight up sure and this is not as a professional but there's so many people in bollywood need these things and they don't know it and i don't think they have access to it because their world is so glamorous and so so many things to do i feel so many of them are in pain and i say this to you because you've worked with some of them and i don't blame them for being in pain man that's the reality that's what reality has done to them so many of them need it uh in fact i feel they'll become even better artists if they uh go through an experience like this yeah for sure well i think a lot of them live in bubbles and they just don't know that these opportunities are out there mm. whether they'll take those opportunities is another thing but i don't think they're exposed to a lot of them you yeah. know because the conversations that i've had about various things that happen around here you know they they all often say well, how, how do you how do you know about that how do you learn about this mm. like, well I, i've only been here a few weeks <laughs> dude it's why podcasts are important culturally i mean i don't see people gaining these things really through netflix documentaries but they just put on a podcast you know while i don't know while just while doing house chores these are the nuggets you can pick up and i'm not trying to sell podcasts to people i'm saying this because i learned about ayahuasca through joe rogan's podcast yeah and uh, i i listened to a lot of episodes and a year after the first time i heard about ayahuasca it came into my life and i knew what it was and i knew what it was capable of and i took that leap and it was the best decision i've ever made for myself back then but again this is not me promoting it it's just me sharing my experience yeah, yeah. um in saying that Did your partner have like an intense experience? No, she didn't. She had more of an intense experience than me. There's no doubt about it, but not like I said, I maybe we shouldn't be comparing, but comparing to the majority of the people there, not an intense ex- experience is weird. Maybe it's because we were both there at the same time. We weren't allowed to be together during the experience like she's uh, in one end of the hall, I'm at the other end, but I don't know. Yeah. Mm. I'll tell you why I'm asking you so many questions about this. Uh when you take ayahuasca or shrooms, if you keep your eyes open, it's like being really stoned. Like it's kind of like that. That's the closest thing to it or being really drunk or something. Mm. I don't know. But it's it's definitely like your reality becomes a little hazy. The moment you close your eyes, at least for me, along with a shaman, along with appropriate music, uh ideally Uh, meditation should precede this process or some sort of prayer should precede this process when you close your eyes that's where a movie starts playing in your head and things start happening at least that's yeah. what it's been for me in both these experiences it begins with that entity like mother ayahuasca or the mushroom and then they take you through a process and it was very different for me with ayahuasca it was like uh i went i i, I went on this like road and i could see little windows where i could enter aspects of my past and i could go to past memory stay there for as long as i'd like and then come back on the road and it helped me heal so many things from my childhood by just going there uh and it it gives you deeper experiences like at the end of my ayahuasca trip i saw a big visualization which actually gave me my answer at that point i was asking ayahuasca if youtubing is the right way to go in life because i'd done engineering like most indian dudes yeah. <laughs> and doing youtube was an extreme jump So it just it showed me like a massive fireball going past me and the mother ayahuasca told me that like this fireball could be your career if you have self belief so take self belief and i opened my eyes and i started crying not out of pain just out of like joy out of knowing something has switched in my head that was ayahuasca with the mushroom it played around with my head when i and i did like my meditation my prayer all that before it 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 opened up aspects of my body showed me a profiling of myself after 7 years of this grind of my career after i gained the self belief after i saw ups and downs what had happened who am i right now it gave me that level of self awareness which definitely happens in some deep meditation sessions but with meditation you really you probably realize three or four things about yourself it showed me 90 things about my own mind and then it showed me the dark stuff as well and told me no no go there mm. and i was fighting it I was fighting and I told my shaman I don't want to fucking go there why is it taking me there and he said okay okay move on go to another part then I started solving the questions that I actually asked of it 
it helped me solve that. It was like some breakup situation that I was solving. The same football breakup. But this was like years after it. So I was I was questioning why I'm taking so long to heal. It healed me there. And after healing me, it took me back to some family situation. It took and me a, to some, some... And family situations that you hadn't remembered until yeah, then. That's yeah. interesting, yeah. And it told me, sort this out, sort this out. But I just wasn't able to during the mushroom trip. But what I ended up with was a task list from the mushroom. It told me, do these things. And I've done two out of the three things. Actually, one out of the three things. Because the other two are too difficult. But it said that that's the stark difference of doing psilocybin with a shaman. That it won't sort out your shit the way Mother Ayahuasca does. It'll give you a task list and tell you, listen, go do these things. And then you've got to sort it yourself. But it'll help you in the process. Yeah. In the same way that mushrooms rot wood in forests. So imagine the wood to be your darkness, or your negativity. The mushrooms will begin the rotting process. But at the end of the day, you've got to like burn it. Ah, interesting. So, yeah, I like that. Um, very, very important life experiences, man. But when you closed your eyes, did you like, did you visualize anything at all? I visualized more when I opened my eyes. Okay. Like I said, when I was on the hammock, I remember putting my hands up, my fingers extended into the branch and the branches extended up into the stars. Mm. That's when I noticed more. And I remember, you know, going to going to the toilet and just seeing, like I said, the vascular system in the walls and in the ground, everything was moving. Mm. And that's when I realized, wow, even the cement is part of earth. It's alive. Everything around us is alive. That's what I saw. And that was on the last evening when my eyes were open, you know. But mm -hmm. like I said, maybe it's because I was around too many people. There's too many distraction. I couldn't focus so much of the beauty in a moment. Mm. Who knows? There was one guy there that was just, <laughs> I thought he was quite entertaining. A lot of people <laughs> were disturbed by it, but he was just screaming, <laughs> screaming big time. And I was thinking, this is this geezer, you know. And uh, But, you know, I know some people said the next day they were disturbed by it. But, you know, it's just a distraction in it, you know. Mm. Like, I tell you what, I had, Nick, this is a funny story, actually, if you've got a second. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I take CBD. Yeah. And in the US, you're allowed to have 0.3% THC mm. in that CBD. So, that's what I usually take on a, on a daily basis to help with sleep, help with uh, relaxation and, and whatnot. You don't really feel any effects of it, though. You know, you don't feel like... You're stoned. You, yeah, you're stoned. It's just mainly the CBD that's doing the work. Anyway, this company that I get the CBD from, they also make another form of of the a product, another brand of the product. And I was in a spare bathroom downstairs. I was watching a movie, and I thought, oh, there's a there's another t um, CBD here. I'll take that before bed. I usually take three the 3,000 milligram strength and I'll take three tinches of that, okay? Over 100 milligrams, I'll take three tinches. And I saw this is 1,200. I was like, oh, right, I could take probably three more of that, or two more of that. So I took them, started watching a movie, and I was like, I think I'm getting, feeling high here. I was like, what's going on? I was like, maybe there's a bad batch that I had in that CBD. And then I was getting worse and worse, and I was thinking, you know, I'm next to my girlfriend. I'm like, at what point do I actually say, freaking high here and it was getting so bad eventually i was like i'm trash i feel off my tits she said i thought you were because you're saying things like this movie's odd and stuff like that there's nothing odd about it it's the gray man you know and uh and i said i had that cbd i think it's a bad batch she said was it the one that said delta eight on it and i said yeah she's like that's pure CBD. Wow. I'd add 160 milligrams. <laughs> oh, no, pure THC, yeah. 160 milligrams of THC. And I've spoken to a lot of people that are just into smoking, and they're like, I don't know anybody that's ever done anything close to 160. So that night, I was closing my eyes. Obviously, I was trying to sleep it off. I was trying to weather the storm. I saw a lot. <laughs> I saw a lot that night, you know? And I remember my wife, was, she, she was looking at the label. She's looking online and she's going, I think we should call the ambulance. I'm like, do not call the ambulance. I'll go upstairs and I'll just weather this storm, you know? But I woke up the next day and I had to film in the morning. I had to film with my sunglasses on because I was still stoned. But <laughs> that was like, that was like a, a like a heroic dose. It felt like it was much more than what THC should have been. It felt 
you know, it felt, it was really weird because I, at the moment I'm like, I just need to straighten myself up. I just got to weather through this because I got to film in the morning. But in the morning, you know, or throughout the next day, I felt so much more clarity mm. in my brain. It's weird. It was so weird because it was so bizarre and hectic and chaotic at the time. But it felt like that chaos, you know, just much like with a sacrifice, that's where the success comes. I felt that I experienced a success following. Mm. So weird. But it's all by accident. Yeah. Only when you know the depths of your own darkness can you like work with healing, yeah. work with light. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like... For me, weight training is therapy. And if I've had a bad day, then I know that's going to be a terribly hard workout. I'm going to hurt for days following because I find that you need to heal those wounds by going a little bit deeper with the, with the training, you know, to a certain degree. You know, the more scar tissue that you build up, the more it's going to heal after. Yeah. Uh, did you get a bad trip, as they call it, like when you were high on THC? Uh, no, I didn't get you bad. It, it, more than anything, I was just thinking, God, how did I do this? You know, it was just a mistake. And I just, I had a film crew coming around at 7 a.m. the next morning. And the whole reason why I took that CBD was to have a really good night's sleep. <laughs> I woke up the next day exhausted, like I hadn't slept at all. Mm, because I think it reduces your REM sleep. Yeah, like that, if too much. I, I actually really wanted to track it. I usually wear an aura ring. I've got it on charge at the mo moment, but it was flat because I was really <laughs> interested in what it did to my sleep. Uh, fair enough. Do you feel like all these experiences, the THC edible experience, the ayahuasca, psilocybin, have you come out a different man from all three? I'd say it's out of everything that I've spoken about, what has had the most profound effect Uh in light with positivity in my life is a Vipassana mm. for me. That was personally, because I tried all these things and I was like, well, let me try the Vipassana. And that was definitely the most positive experience for me. And I, I would probably do it every year, you know, as in like a top up, you know, because it's very important that you continue your meditation technique following that, you know, they'll recommend like three hours a day. I'm not going to do three hours a day, <laughs> but I'll do, you know, 20, uh, 30 minutes in the morning and maybe 20 minutes in the evening. That's what I do right now. But until, you know, I'll keep that top up. So the end of the year that I'll maybe do another 10 day, you know, kind of go boot camp again. Yeah. If, if 10 years back, you told me Chris Gethin would be speaking to me about Vipassana and psilocybin and ayahuasca, dude, I wouldn't have believed it. You were a different person. Yeah. You would have, I've been following you for a while. Yeah, uh, I was definitely, you know, like I wasn't following a lot of the protocols that I'm doing now in regards to eating organic or whatever. I just had this, a lot of aggression. Yeah. A lot I, of aggression that I used to my advantage to help bo my bodybuilding goals. And, you know, I, 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 I got into bodybuilding because I love weight training. A lot of people get into bodybuilding because they like bodybuilding. Yeah. I love weight training and I love seeing how far I can push myself in the gym mm. and that created a different sort of mindset because I've always been very competitive, not so much in team sports, you know, competed in motocross, downhill mountain biking, Ironman triathlon, ultra marathon, uh, bodybuilding. It's always been a, a singular journey mm. and I, I'd always have to close myself off and kind of turn into what this AKA character of mine was, which was cage muscle in order to produce those yeah. results. So I had to turn into it like a bit, bit of a different person, but now I've been able to eliminate the gap between the alter ego and myself now. There's a story I've been holding back from you since the time I met you, even on this podcast. And I thought I'll bring it up in the end. We actually have to talk about diets as well. Yeah. But before getting to the diet section, I'm thinking I'll bring in this story. You've interacted with me for an hour and a half right now. Do you feel I wish bad for you? No, not at no. all. Uh, you feel like I'm just trying to learn from you, right? Sure, we're just interacting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you and me have interacted in the past in a negative way. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This is going to get juicy. <laughs> uh, the reason, so when Chris Gethin was brought up as a name for this show, I agreed immediately for this moment. Oh, what's going to okay. happen right now. All right. Because I wanted to apologize to you. Interesting. Yeah. For something that I did. No, some, for something that I did. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, this is like back in 2010. No. The, oh, when I first came here. 2010, 2011. Right. Okay. Um, and this is one thing I love about foreigners who are into fitness. Uh, there's definitely that same sense of aggression and go-getting. But at least back then in Indian 
gyms in Indian fitness, there was a lot of jealousy and insecurity flying around and aggression, obviously. Like if you went to like an Indian gym, people would be comparing themselves to each other and putting down the other dude and saying, oh, you've dropped your body and all that. And you'd notice that most of those dudes have stuck to the process of weight training for the wrong reasons. And it's usually insecurity. You know, they're insecure about something in their life. They think they're ugly. They think they're short. They think they're fat. They think whatever. That's why the majority of people get into bodybuilding. Yeah. I got bullied, whatever. Yeah. And the ones that stick to it, stick to it because of the wrong motivations in terms of, oh, I'm going to put my anger into this, etc. And I was one of those dudes as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm sure you started like in a similar way. For sure. Uh, 100%. But you need to work that shit out for yourself as a man, get past your own insecurities and then start training for the right reasons, which is just therapeutic. Or going into your own body. Like one thing I've got to learn about you from this episode is that you experiment with your own body a lot. And I love doing that as well. Um, you know, so you've got to kind of transition into the right zone. Now, keep in mind when this had happened, I was in like the wrong zone, man. You know, there was alcohol in my life. Like I was, I've dealt with alcoholism and this was probably around the same time. So uh, I think this is when you were just kind of gaining your name in the Indian fitness scene. And my first impulse towards you as a 19 year old, I'm 29 now, so this happened 10 years ago. As a 19-year-old, I saw a fit guy becoming Hrithik Roshan's trainer. You were like, like you know, your, your photos and all that. I remember your tattoos, man, like all that. My first impulse towards you, honestly, was jealousy. Like I was jealous, I was envious of you. Because I felt like, you know, sometimes as a fitness coach or as a fitness enthusiast, you think you know everything about form and you think that everyone else is not up to the mark, especially mm -hmm. if you're scientifically oriented. So I would always like look down upon you in conversations with friends. Oh no, Chris Gethin doesn't know anything. And this one time, um, I think you'd put up a photo of your legs. And uh, my my account name was Beer Biceps even back then. This was way before oh, the actual... Oh, funny. Uh, and I, uh, I trolled you in that. Like a, a friend of me tagged uh, my account under your post. And I wrote something like, he's a steroid user. <laughs> and uh, you lashed out at me. And I loved fights. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a very different person. That, that's now. terrible then because that, I liked fights back then <laughs> as well. I'd argue with everybody online. Uh, and we we had this long ass argument, which became famous not only in my gym, but at my workplace. I was doing this internship with this finance firm back then. It became famous that this guy took on Chris Gethin. Uh, do you remember that we met in Soho House? Two weeks oh, yeah, ago. yeah, I remember that, yeah. I wanted to come up and tell you this, but <laughs> I had a gut feeling we'll do a podcast. Oh, that. that's cool. Uh, honestly, two things, man. Firstly, I'm really sorry. Like, no, it's all right. I thought you was going to say, hey, I was the guy that got you banned from Gold's Gym here. <laughs> I was like, is you? All right, okay, but no. No, 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 no. Uh, it, I was just acting out of place of immaturity and jealousy. Uh, and secondly, man, uh, honestly, even, even you, you've changed. Like, I feel if that same thing happened to you now, you wouldn't even lash out. You're no, I'd probably defend myself, you know, because I try to defend myself from people. What what's what's what I know is my truth, and what's right. And you know, people always have their assumptions, so I always try to you know argue my point to a certain degree to defend my position. But I don't go out there and just lash out now or try to. Okay, this is an argument. Okay, pain bodies here. Let's go for it. Yeah, you know. So I, I've read about Eckhart Tolle, the power of now. So <laughs> I realized to back off. I think when you're not past that phase as a fitness enthusiast, you kind of look for fights a lot more. You know, you kind of look for places outside of the gym where you can channelize aggression without actually hitting someone. Yeah. Like none of us want to kind of get into physical alterations or cause physical harm on anyone. Yeah, for but sure. But the internet becomes like this nice juicy place to kind of act out in oh, terms of aggression. Everyone's a UFC champ online, <laughs> you know? That's, that's true. But you see it all, you know, it hasn't changed in the culture, you know, uh, all around the world. You know, the online culture is just a victim of it where they see somebody and they think, okay, that's, I'm not living up to those expectations, so I'm going to bring them down to mine. Yeah. And, uh, like, I, I, I see it now as a witness to other people. Like, I'm sure you know Mike Cohern. Yeah. Everybody has said for years and years and years, these guys on steroids, he's not natural, whatever. Well, I like to give him the benefit of the doubt. I've trained with that guy several times and I've seen the life that he lives. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But people don't see that. They don't see what he was like at 16 years old mm. when he was winning world titles at that age, you know, and here he is now 52 yeah. and apps lifting more than the, the enhanced guys. But is he looking like the enhanced guys? No, he's not. Mm. So, you know, I think it all comes down to the perspective, what you see behind 
the, the what you see online yeah. that you know that 40 odd years or 30 odd years of training and dedication kind of living like a monk you know it's just an easier sport to point the finger at yeah you know if you look at somebody that's a car racer and right you know faster than anyone else you're not going to say it's because <laughs> it's the fuel that he's put in his car you know it's probably the driver yeah 100 percent. i mean the main kind of outcome for me from this sec session section is uh i'm sorry like uh, didn't mean it man like i didn't know what i was doing so i appreciate it brother yeah. i appreciate it genuine apology to you i i there's something that tells me you probably will remember that particular argument because I really riled you up. Right. Like the moment I caught on to the fact that you're being aggressive, I tried like pinching you even more. Yeah. So it it I was also acting out of a place of my own childhood trauma. So yeah, you'll sorry have to about send that. me some screenshots or so we'll, we'll re <laughs> revisit that. The weird thing is I probably still have the screenshots. That'd be funny. <laughs> send them to me, man. That'd be quite funny to have a look back at. Because I want to know what I was like back then because there was a time here in India, like I, this is how I went down the biohacking route. I got mold toxicity when I was living in an apartment underneath uh, John Abraham. I was training John Abraham at the time. And I got mold toxicity, which led to me having literally three hours of sleep a night. Uh, mm. So I wasn't a good person to be around. I was an absolute asshole. And um, This was for Shootout at Wadala? Pardon? There was a movie John Abraham did called Shootout at Wadala, which is... That movie and Force, these two movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, Force, yeah. Were the two best John Abraham physiques. And I'm yeah. assuming you were part of... Just after Force. Okay. Just after yeah, so Force. It I was, was probably I was shoot part out of him, yeah. And uh, I got mold toxicity then. And uh, so, train like, my training at that time was at its all-time highest because I was so aggressive. And I was like, I don't give a fuck who you are. I'm going to out-train you even though I'm not going to get sleep. I'm going to outwork you. And that's just the mentality that I had on myself, mm. on myself. And I was riding so much. I, I, I recorded an album here. Um, I wrote two books here. Uh, th thankfully, I self-published. And uh, when I look back at what I'd written, not only for the music, but in, in his books, I'm like, who was that person? <laughs> honestly, honestly. And, and at that time, I knew that wasn't me. That's why I went and sought help. I went and stayed in a clinic in... Uh, Oldsmar, Florida for six weeks to try to get detoxed. And um, I knew at that time there was something wrong. So now when I reflect back and I see, you know, maybe the argument that I had with you, you know, I'd look at that and go, wow, who was that person? That was an aggressive cat. Mm. He just wanted a fight. Mm. So if you came to a fight with me, then this was the perfect scenario. This is the perfect war. Yeah, I wouldn't ever come up for to fight with you. Hey, <laughs> looks are deceiving, buddy. I'm, I'm a soft cat. Uh, yeah, that's what I've gotten to know about you over the course of this episode. Let's talk about John Abraham a bit. Yeah. How is it different training him? I've had him on the show. That guy is motivated. Yeah, he's a, he's he, a cool guy. He's got that same sharp level of motivation at 50 that he probably had when he was 22. Is he 50 now? Yeah. Wow. Like I only saw him two weeks ago, if that. I was in um, I was in a gym and I, I bumped into him and he looks great. Mm. Looks phenomenal. I didn't know he was 50 now. Yeah. And he's and, got a lot of positive energy about yeah, him. Yeah, very, very chilled out, very positive, very laid back. Like I remember him just being so, so laid back. And, uh, you know, we I train him very differently to Riddick because he just doesn't sleep. The guy doesn't sleep, you know, because he wears so many hats you know, with his production company, yeah. looking after sports teams and, and whatnot, a lot of responsibility. So knowing that he wasn't sleeping much, then I wouldn't train him as much. You know, I wouldn't train five, six days a week like I do with Riddick because Riddick will live like a monk where John, he'd come in at two o'clock in the morning, we're training at six. Mm -hmm. So I'd, we wouldn't be training that often, maybe like four times a week, three or four times a week. Uh, but he would never moan, not once, even though he's on like three or four hours sleep. One whinge, I'd say, okay, this is what we got to do today. Okay, you know, grab the hundred pound dumbbells. Let's go. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's known to lift heavy. He's very strong, mm. very strong guy. You know what Parsis are like? Uh, they're in they're an ethnicity from Iran. Oh yeah, technically yeah. as in they're Iranian, but they live in India because of historical reasons. Right. So uh, Parsis are strong oh, dudes. <laughs> right. Yeah, he seems like a naturally strong guy. Mm. You know, he's got like a uh, just like a big frame. Yeah. Big frame, so, you know, like farmer strong, we call mm, it. Like naturally God-gifted strength. Yeah, um, exactly. But, I mean, when a dude is that strong, as a trainer, I'm assuming that you load him up even with more weight. So his high repetitions will be done with a much heavier dumbbell than 
uh, someone who doesn't have that kind of natural strength. Yeah, for sure. But sometimes they don't have the cardiovascular capacity or they don't have that much aerobic strength. Gotcha. So let's say, you know, some people are very good with endurance. They can do those reps with the weight longer. Mm. Where someone that's very, very strong, sometimes they stop very short because they've got a lot more anaerobic strength. Mm. So it's, it's all dependent mm. on that person. Mm. You know, luckily I've got a bit of both. That's yeah. why I'm able to do bodybuilding. But if I want to do an Ironman triathlon, I can go do it. Mm. Anything else that's very specific to training John Abraham? Like about his body? Uh, no, you know, other than, you know, obviously is, is when it comes to the nutrition, because he's pescatarian, I don't know if he still is, you know, obviously the, the food variety is very limited, mm. you know, like he'd eat a lot of eggs, a lot of egg whites, a lot of fish, you know, and de depend on, uh, you know, supplements such as protein powders a little bit more. But other than that, no, there wasn't anything that really stuck out other than his dedication, very dedication. Like he's, he would never miss a workout ever. Would he miss a meal? No. You know, even though he'd be lacking on time and lacking on sleep, he'd still make it. How do you make up for that lack of sleep? Because sleep, if done right, is the strongest supplement you can have. Can't make up for it. Can't make up for it. Impossible. Like obviously nutrition helps with the recovery, but sleep is number one. And everything falls into place after that. A lot of people that I see that get injured is through lack of sleep. You know, the body is in a state of recovery when you're training it. You know, something's going to go wrong. You know, if you have something, and especially with hydration, you know, you think of an elastic band when it perishes due to exposure, you know, you've got all the, it'll snap. And that's what I see with, uh, with people and their bodies all the time. They get injured because they just haven't slept. They're not hydrated. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been reading a lot of meditation research for the meditation app that we're building. It's called mm -hmm. Level. And there were two things that stuck out for Level. And we're trying to actually incorporate these things into Level. The first is yoga nidra. Have you heard of this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and even Huberman talks about yoga nidra. Yeah. And when he spoke about it, it kind of really got me thinking because this guy is all about peer-reviewed studies, science-based, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Have you ever tried yoga nidra? Oh, yeah, of course. You feel it actually? So, I mean, I'd love for you again to explain what yoga nidra is from your perspective. Well, from my perspective is that, you know, you're focusing on one nostril, uh, you know, with your breath and the other nostril. And what I found, especially when you're doing what do you call it, like the fast breathing? What would you call it? Is it a particular name for Pranayam. that? Pranayam. The prana, yeah. Is that, it's much like PNF stretching. You know PNF stretching when mm. you're pushing against that individual, they're pushing against you and then they stretch a little bit further. I found that with the yoga nidra and the prana is that it really helps slow and deepen your breath. Yeah. So all of a sudden everything feels calm. You've got a calmer, deeper breath everything slows down at the time when you're doing it like i remember the first time i did it with uh, my instructor i'm like why am i doing this this is stupid i just want to focus on meditation and mm. being chilled but then i after like literally a minute of doing it i'm like okay now i understand it i'm feeling more relaxed now more of in a like a subconscious state i feel like the world overall is just going to gravitate towards meditation for over sure. the next 10 years and one of the other things that has been of benefit for me and uh, my clients as well is cold therapy mm. like every single day i'll do an ice bath for three minutes in the morning and i'll do one minute in the evening and i don't know if you know that you know it helps tone your vagal nerve that takes you from that sympathetic into your parasympathetic state you know, as long as you've got your neck or your thyroid submerged under wow. under the water. So, you know, I'm trying to do that in the hotel that I'm at at the moment, but can't really fit in the, in the bathtub properly, but I'm trying it. Um, but that is something that has really, really helped me from a mental perspective because really? it helps stabilize my mood. And also it stabilizes your blood sugar levels as well. So, I, you know, I measure my blood sugar uh, with everything that I eat. And it, if I do the ice bath in the morning, my blood sugar levels are so much more stable as well. So less irregularities, less energy troughs, less cravings, et cetera. Mm. So many benefits to it. Why do you think it just hits that one nerve? I'm sure it hits other nerves, but oh, yeah. it has a deeper all, effect. All your that. nodes in your body, of course, your excitatory parts of, of your body, uh, but also the, the neck as well is where the vagal nerve is. And if you if you contrast that with hot and cold therapy, so I always start with sauna, I always finish with cold, uh, but definitely finish with the cold. It helps tone that area so it can balance the mood so much easier. If it isn't toned, then it's mm. going to sway one way or the other. Much like, you know, you'll see people that are, 
like a bipolar, you know, they're completely different one to the other, but we have more subtle versions of that within ourselves on day to day basis, especially with the environment that we live in today. Mm. So I think ice therapy is going to become more and more popular mm. as you know, we're definitely having more science with Wim Hof having mm. so much tests, so many tests put on himself on how it can help balance the mood, how it can improve the immune response as well. Mm. Like uh, he got injected and some of his uh, uh, workers with E. coli and is able to reject it through ice and breath, yeah, through like breath work as immunity well. Immunity was really high. Oh yeah, unbelievable. Mm. You know, it's phenomenal. And they thought, well, is he just, you know, is it just whim? But no, they did it on uh, his his uh, his teachers as well. He's a perfect example of someone who's taken from ancient Indian culture and brought it to the West and he's making himself an example for the West to study. Yeah. Uh, when they talk about Indian like rishis who went to the Himalayas, they did things like this. Yeah. Uh, there are certain Kriyas which you're supposed to do in cold water, ice. I don't know yeah. the Kriyas myself. Yeah, for sure. And uh, like the Russians, they even used to put their babies outside <laughs> in the winter. You know, they'd put them in the carts, but there's pictures of this online. You'll find it like in the 1930s because they they truly believed that it helped with their immune response mm -hmm. as they got older. Yeah, uh, probably. I mean, it might be some version of you getting used to the cold as you grow up or For sure. as you grow older. For sure. Uh, you know, that's probably why I sweat all the time <laughs> because I'm so used to cold now. <laughs> I think Wim Hof says that... Um, if you don't go to the cold, the cold will come to you. Yeah, that's Which true. means like sickness will like come to you or you'll feel cold. But dealing with cold on a regular basis definitely has its long-term benefits, man. For sure, in every aspect of your life. And I think, you know, we've become a culture that's very soft now. Mm. And we always seek comfort, yet we're getting sicker. We're dying earlier we're for more complications. Yet we've become the most comfortable generation ever. So what's going wrong? Well, we're not getting comfortable being uncomfortable. So we need to seek the discomfort, whether that be working out, whether it be cold, hot therapy, making sure that we are not hitting a snooze button. If it's raining outside, the monsoons, go out for a run. Your skin's waterproof. You know, you'll get through it. So uh, I think, you know, we've just become a culture of like, we want it delivered now. We want the Wi-Fi to be quicker. We want to avoid the traffic. We want the AC on and we want to seek comfort. But, you know, we need to get more uncomfortable, much like our ancestors did. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I would like to believe that the world is going in that direction. Yeah. Um, for the final section of this particular episode, Mr. Gethin, uh, everyone's been waiting for your diet breakdowns on this one. Um, you've trained Hrithik Roshan, you've trained John Abraham. I'm sure you've trained many more Bollywood stars. Yeah. Um, let's specifically talk about these two. When you're helping someone put on muscle, um, is there a mathematical formula you follow? Like, do you go for X grams of protein per kilogram of body weight? Is it nuanced based on, you know, the, the particular person? Where do carbs come in? What's your take on fat? You can go as scientific as you want to go. Uh, the audience kind of knows the basics, but at the same time, we'll, we'll cover everything. We'll cover the basics, we'll cover the advanced stuff as well. Yeah, it's it's not really that uh, advanced, to be honest. It's very, it's very simple. I try not to overcomplicate things. I think when you've got more variables that can go wrong, then you know, you're know you looking for trouble. Mm. So I try to keep it very, very simple. So as an example, we'll talk about Riddick now because I'm, I'm working with him right now and I can remember everything I can recall, is that I recently had him on like 4,800 calories. What? Uh, yeah, 4,800 calories because when I first saw him now, I was like, okay, you need to get in shape, but you have no muscle on your frame. He hasn't been training. Uh, so I really need, even though I wanted to diet him down immediately because he's holding so much body fat, we had no choice but to uh, you know, go into a mass building phase. So he was eating a lot of clean calories. The only fats that he was having was several egg yolks. He'd have uh, two tablespoons of olive oil and he would have uh, naturally occurring fats. I'd have him to supplement with a tablespoon of uh, EPA and DHEAs as well. But everything was just, everything else was coming in the form of protein and carbohydrates. You know, your typical chicken, uh, you know, poultry, your meat, your fish, your protein powder, that's his protein sources. And then the carbohydrates coming from rice, there was some roti in there. There was uh, a lot of, a lot of potato, oats. Mm. Uh, and that was it, you know, it split into six meals and a shake every single day. Now his carbohydrates were higher on his training days 
than his non-training days and even higher on chest day. So I'm really trying to bring up that uh, weakness at the moment. Isn't allowed to eat for a good 90 minutes before bed, but his goal is to eat immediately upon wakening. Gotcha. So uh, that's the goal because obviously he's fasted for a duration. I need to take him out of catabolism and put him into anabolism by having food as soon as possible. And then drinking about a gallon of water a day. A lot of people don't perform, not because of nutrition, it's because of hydration. And unfortunately, a lot of people wait until they're thirsty, which is probably a signal for dehydration, until they drink. And, you know, if your body's made up of about 7% fluid and you're dehydrated by, say, 3%, you could be down in productivity by about 20%. Mm. So it's very important to stay hydrated as well. So, you know, that's the perspective. And, you know, we'll take digestive enzymes, maybe some apple cider vinegar, uh, some pineapple as well with those meals to help with the breakdown and the insulin response to them. Maybe a little bit of activity after certain meals whenever he can get the activity in because he's, he's a busy guy. Uh, but that's kind of what it looks like. By activity, you mean like a walk or a jog? Yeah, or something. it could be like 10 minute walk. It could be, you know, a lot of the time I'll say, okay, wherever you are, if you're in your trailer, I want you to stand up and sit down 50 times. <laughs> you know, if you're on if you're on a plane, you go to the toilet and you go and stand up and sit down, do some toilet squats, you know. Got it. Just to get the body activated. Get the body moving and help with the blood sugar response after having a meal of that bit size because he's eating big meals. But now we've gone into the fat burning phase. So uh, those has come down to about two thousand eight hundred calories now, and it'll come. It'll continue to come down now, dependent on how much weight. You know, he's, he's still losing weight on that, so I'm not going to change it. I only make changes when we plateau. Gotcha. Um, is there like an X number of grams of protein that uh, you stick to in your bulk and your cut? Yeah, yeah. It could be as high as like one point five grams of protein. Per, per uh, kilogram? Uh, per pound of body weight. Per pound. Okay. Yeah, per pound of body weight. I gotcha. can't remember the kilos now. It's been a long time. <laughs> and uh, then I'll probably come down to about one gram of protein per pound of body weight as we're getting into the shredding phase more. Mm. Be- okay. Just to retain. Okay. I think the assumption earlier used to be that when you're shredding, you have like higher levels of protein to prevent muscle loss. Has that changed lately? Yeah, I always go and become lower, you know. Okay. Uh, carbohydrates are protein sparing, that's true. But, you know, I, if you're taking in too much protein, that can still lead to fat. You, mm. know? you know, a lot of people think it's just protein and carbs. But when we get into, you know, single digit body fat levels, you have to cut everything. Mm. You know, how, how do you know if it's too much protein? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just know that their body's plateauing. They're just not able to utilize... Uh, you know, lose the body fat. Like that's but, visual for you. Yeah, it's, everything's visual for me. I take pictures every week, gotcha. uh, but I look at him every day just to make sure I can see everything's going in the right direction. The weaknesses are continuing into strengths. Uh, but I've got a, quite a good eye. You know, I used to be a judge at bodybuilding shows as well. And I was always very, very critical of myself. You know, people always look at themselves in their favorite lighting in the best mirror, look at the best body part. I always like to look at the worst <laughs> body part in the worst lighting and when that is impressive then you know you've got something you gotcha. know it's like you know when i used to compete in shows my goal was not to impress the people you know the judges at the front the person that was just coming in through mm. the back of the auditorium i wanted to impress that person you know mm. uh in terms of like the worst food that you can possibly put in your body in a phase like this would you say it's like processed food and sugar for sure. Sugar, yeah, it's terrible for longevity anyway. It's in, in, inflammatory. And uh, anything that is deep fried, because a lot of the fruit is fried in, you know, refined seed oils, canola oil, things like that, soybean oil. So that's very pro-inflammatory. We try to stay away from a lot of the omega-6s mm-hmm. and go for more of the anti-inflammatory omega-3 foods. Uh, you know, so if it's grilled, if it's like just pan-fried, with some olive oil, that's absolutely fine. But when you're going for the deep fried, yeah, you need to stay away from that. And a lot of the creamy foods that you get here in India, I know the foods taste absolutely awesome. But I'm testing a lot of these foods now as well in my blood glucose monitor, seeing the response. A lot of it is carb laden. You, you, know, you mean no like protein. gravies? But and yeah, like yeah, creamy gravies. Mm. You know, if it's a lighter sauce and it's not as much calories, and great, you know, like. Riddick Chef has learned to do some phenomenal sauces just with spinach and put some kimchi in there, a little bit of avocado, whatever. And the final key question in this entire podcast, what about supplementation when it comes to Bollywood? 
uh, we had Basu Shankar, who's the coach of the Indian cricket team. So he's, you know, all, all about sports science and he spoke about the importance of creatine for athletes. I supplement a lot with creatine. I feel it just changes the shape of my body, my performance in the gym. Therefore, the shape of my body even more. I am assuming that you administer creatine to your clients. Yeah, creatine for sure. It's the most studied amino acid out of all the amino acids for its purity, safety, and performance. So yeah, for sure, you know, that's a supplement that I get my clients on. But again, you have some people that are responders and that can take the creatine molecule, the size of the particle. Some people can't. So then you have to look at this, the type of the creatine. So uh, if they can't take a monohydrate, which majority of people can, that's the most studied one, they'll have to take a, like a micronized uh, HCL uh, type of creatine. So everybody's different on the type of creatine that they'd respond to as well. But creatine, yeah, the basics, um, you know, the protein powders, the glutamine, the multivitamins, but then you go down a rabbit hole based on their blood work. Maybe they need glutathione, especially after the age of 40. Maybe they need more NMN, especially after the age of 40. If they're low in B12, maybe they don't absorb vitamin D through the sun. So they have to go very high when it comes to the vitamin D and K2 supplementation. Yeah, I think this is the kind of breakdown for another whole episode. Like oh, okay. We could go down a rabbit hole yeah. of supplementation. Maybe... In this one, we won't really talk much about the supplements because what I've assumed is that it's different depending on the person's blood Everybody's work. Everybody's different. Everyone's mm. different. Mm. Okay. You know, I like to look at the blood work first before saying, okay. Because the thing is, all supplements have got a health responsibility to them. Mm. You take them all, you'll probably die. Mm. You know, so you have to look at it logically. Yeah. Um, what about protein shakes, plant protein versus whey protein versus isolates? Do you, do you acknowledge plant protein? For like, sure. Do you, yeah. think, you think it works For well? sure. My own brand has a plant protein. Okay. So with plant protein, uh, pea protein is going to be the most bioavailable. Mm -hmm. However, they still have plant defense mechanisms called lectins. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you have a digestive enzyme to help break that down and increase the surface space of that peptide. Okay. okay. So your body can absorb it that much easier. But if you do have that, then it will have a, a positive effect. So do plant proteins, like, uh, do they usually get manufactured with that enzyme inbuilt? You No, they don't always. You'd have to add that to it. What's the enzyme called? Uh, pro, there's two enzymes. Uh, the the main one for plant-based is called IOA. IOA. Okay. IOA technology, basically. Mm. And then the other one, which is usually more so, but it can be used in plant protein, but usually uh, more so in whey proteins, is called Prohydrolyze. And gotcha. that's an enzyme that'll help down, help break down the isolate into a smaller fraction to be absorbed easier. Mm, okay. Uh, and speaking about whey protein in general, uh, do you do you feel like whey protein has a better effect on human bodies than plant protein, or is it again subjective based on the person? Subject based on the person, especially of their background. If they want to go for something that's plant based, they don't want to have dairy or anything like that. Um, I personally think whey is better. Uh, but I don't have a, pro like I take the plant protein. I love it. Um, but I think whey protein is going to have a better response, a better anabolic response. You know, it's got the complete essential amino acid profile, yeah. um, uh, you know, but you can add extra leucine to a plant-based protein to make it a little bit more anabolic as well. Mm. Have you noticed whey protein causing skin issues with people? Like I see that with a lot of Indian guys. I don't know now whether it is some Indian genetics angle here. But a lot of my friends deal with everything from pimples to bloating to some sort of rashes because of whey protein. Do you think it's because of using lower quality whey proteins or is it probably because of their subjective response to dairy? It could be both subject to their response to dairy, but I'd say it's probably the quality of the protein more than anything. Um, you know, like I know people that take and isolate that are cyst cystic fibrosis sufferers. Mm -hmm. So they have an allergen towards a lot of proteins. But if they take one that's of high premium grade, it's non-GMO, uh, it's got less than one gram of lactose, they're usually absolutely fine. Mm. You know, oh. So I always tell people as well, look, go get a gut microbiome test. There's a company called Viome that does it. There's a lot of companies out there. And see if your body is like has a lot of histamine or there's some sort of sensitivity that you have to a particular food. And maybe you have to do an elimination process during or for a while and then maybe fix the leaky gut syndrome that you have. Mm. A lot of people will eliminate a food and go, okay, I feel good now. And then they try to introduce it again in six months time, uh, but they don't really understand the negative side effects. You have to heal 
the gut microbiome. Let's say if you've done antibiotics or you've had pro-inflammatory foods, processed foods, um, all of this is going to upset the gut microbiome and you're going to cause gut dysbiosis. Mm. So then you need to fix it and then introduce it again. Mm. Whoa, okay. Again, this is one of those things we got to break down on a whole other episode, man. And yeah. uh, knowing you as a person now, I feel like you're a learner, you're a researcher, and you're an explorer of life. Like you do all sorts of things, even outside of the world of health. So I'm just looking forward to like meeting you again, Chris. But what's next for you? Like in life, what's happening this year? Uh, this year, okay. Well, so for me personally, with my own training, I've actually got back into bodybuilding. Uh, I'd kind of stepped away from it and got into hybrid athleticism and then with the injuries. Uh, but I'm going to be guest posing uh, on a bodybuilding stage next year. So we're going to document that process of, again, muscle, kind of like the video trainers that I've done before. But this will have uh, a different approach on how to do it in your late 40s, 50s. Mm -hmm and how to avoid injuries and how to do it from an anti-aging perspective to try to reverse your biological age. And then the end goal will be me guest posing uh, on, on the stage. And I haven't guest posed since 2009, so that's going to be quite exciting. <laughs> See what the body can do at, at 48 now. And uh, then, you know, we're, we're opening two more gyms here in India. You know, we've got the, myself and Jag have the, the gym franchise, Chris Gethin Gyms. We're opening two more here now in India. And then what I'm looking forward to is uh, in 2024, because 2023 is booked up, is that I'm going to go and live in a van. My, myself and my partner are just going to do van life for about eight months and just <laughs> travel around the US, you know? Wow. That's a goal. Yeah. Ooh. No, it's crazy. So, so we have to delegate as much as we possibly can between now and then so we can go and enjoy that without too much distraction. Why are you doing that though? Because I, I just feel like I want to explore a lot more. Like I definitely want to travel a lot more overseas. That feels like it's a calling that I want to explore more cultures. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm hope to go to the Amazon next year with a couple of my friends that are from the Marines. And uh, we will definitely be going off a beaten track and living with some tribes for a while. You know, no other, you know, it's not as if that you can go on a, an organized tour to do this. This is something that the Marines, some of them from the Amazon uh, that have done before. And I, I, I know them and I may be doing that. You know, I want, just want to explore different cultures, different tribes, different experiences. But I thought, well, look, the U.S. is so vast. And let's go and do that in a van first, you know, and uh, that's what myself and my partner are planning on doing. Yeah. You know, the more I talk to you, the more I feel I didn't do justice to this particular podcast because you've got that much to share, man. But... Uh, oh, that's it. I'm spent now. I got nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> no, but knowing how much you come to India, I'm honestly looking forward to doing this with you more regularly. You know, maybe the next time you're here, yeah, I'm sure. sure you'll have a whole new set of things to share, man. Yeah, well, myself and a couple of uh, other friends in the biohacking space that are internationally recognized, we're thinking of doing a tour here in November or December. So mm. I'll, I'll keep you informed of that. Oh, very cool. Chris Gethin, thank you for speaking to us on the show, man. Thank you for giving out this knowledge. Like, oh, no, doing... Thank you. I appreciate it. I'd heard a lot about you. And this podcast, and it's been a pleasure to actually experience it in person. No, likewise, likewise. This is, uh, in many ways, a teenage dream come true for me. Uh, so, not well, in the romantic Katy Perry video, yeah, kind of sense. Say, I hope you don't have any posters <laughs> of me on your ceiling, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just, I had to have this conversation with you for a very long time. I'm just glad I got to learn from you, man. You're like a whole kind of library of knowledge. And looking forward to doing more episodes with you, my Let's man. Let's do it, brother. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you. Appreciate it. At the start of this podcast, I promised you to science the shit out of it. And that's what I hope that we did over the course of this episode. We couldn't pack all the gems from this conversation into this one podcast episode. Those gems have been uploaded in an unfiltered format on our other YouTube channel, TRS Clips, where you'll only find highlights of this podcast. And for more fantastic podcasts like this, make sure you follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. I feel we've only scratched the surface when it comes to Chris Gethin's knowledge about the world of health. Chris, brother, return on the show very soon.